Good morning, everybody. Brett Hoare, ADRP, coming to you live early on a Friday. Uh, early because we have to work around a very special international guest and his time frame. I believe it's about 6.30 in India at the moment. So if everyone could be grateful and very welcoming to Richie Crampton. Thanks for your time, Richie. Hey, Brett. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, it is getting late. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was just going back through some notes and um, it's only taken me since June 2015 when you and I first started communicating about me wanting to get you on and have a chat with you after the awesome success of your top fuel uh, first year, I guess. So it's only taken me two years so it, and, a, and an impending trip to Australia thanks to the Lamartinas that we're finally here. So uh, thanks so much for your time, man. Yeah, of course. Well, my apologies for it taking so long. I guess uh, wish I would have done it sooner. Yeah, I don't think it was your fault. I'll take most of the blame for that. You've had a little <laughs> bit on your plate over the last two years, and we'll, we'll get to that now if we can. So, a 17-year-old kid in South Australia, Adelaide, decides that he wants to go drag racing. Um, that's where it all seems to have started in the in the Richie Crampton story. Is, is that rel relatively accurate? Yeah, pretty much. You know, going uh, going to the racetrack with my dad uh, as long as I could remember when I was a kid, and making the odd trip over to, to be a spectator at Calder Park as an early teenager made me want to go drag racing. And yeah, my parents and and, and myself we, we put together what we could, which was a FC Holden station wagon with a big block Chevy in it, and went drag racing pretty much as soon as I had my driver's license. Now, uh, the carbureted car for a start, your dad had. And hot rod shop in Adelaide, didn't you? That was where the foundation came from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I used to uh, hang around my dad's carburetor shop, of course, and um, you know that's kind of where I got the bug to go racing. Uh, you know, to rewind a little bit, he got me into go kart racing when I was about ten years old, and I did that into my early teenage years as well. So that's where I learned a lot about working on cars and got the bug to uh, to go race and 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 work on hot rods and race cars and stuff and. Uh, Little did I know it was going to uh, lead me to the U.S. and, you know, all the stuff that I've been able to do since. So, of course, go-karts, because back in those early days, not that you're that old at all. I mean, you're, you haven't even turned 37 yet, but um, we didn't have a junior dragster program in Australia at that stage, so go-karts were really the only outlet. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, I know if junior drag racing was... Uh, you know, I, there were signs of it coming to Australia back then, I can remember. But um, if I would have had the option to, to, to race go-karts or junior dragsters, I know which, which it would have been. But uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities that, you know, and, and got to learn a bit about turning corners and using the brakes a bit as well. So, um, but no, I, I just, just had a lot of fun in my early years. Okay, so it started out as a, a carbureted big block um, for, as a 17-year-old kid, uh, new obviously South Australia driving license and uh, Andra 16 year olds can, can race full bodied cars. It didn't take you long, a couple of years to move it up to a, a supercharged deal. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much as with, uh, you know, I think a lot of people will have a familiar story where you kind of overgrow the race car, but we just kept trying to make the thing go faster and faster. And, uh, yeah, I think by the time I was 20 or 21 years old, we had the car running in the seven second zone and, uh, racing it, you know, in Adelaide and Mildura. And we even took it to the Western Nationals in Perth one time and uh, raced it in Super Sedan. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, man. I, I, I can remember the big difference from uh, going from the carburetor 10-second uh, race car to, you know, a supercharged alcohol race car. It was, uh, it was really neat. But, uh, yeah, I learned a lot and had a lot of fun racing at that kind of grassroots level with, with that kind of car around Australia. Okay. And do you remember what sort of numbers that car bested at? I, I think it ran 765 uh, at a little over 150 miles an hour. Um, uh, that was kind of later in the piece. But, uh, yeah, I, I remember, you know, bracket racing the thing or, you know, racing in super sedan and, and dialing in, you know, low eights on, on the window. So um, it, was pretty, it was pretty fun. Awesome, awesome. Um, so obviously the demise of, of Adelaide at the time, I think around 2001, 2002, led to, uh, I guess I should have prefaced that a little different, perhaps the unfortunate 
turned into fortune or lemons turned into lemonade. I mean, you went from, we had a local track, oh, we haven't got a local track, what am I going to do? And that led you to, to Sydney. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the Calder Park in Adelaide, we're running less races and basically close the doors kind of thing. And uh, I'd been lucky enough to meet a guy called Jim Wilton and he introduced me to Graham Cowan and um, – I'm, I managed to talk Jim Wilton into, uh, you know, Jim Wilton used to race top fuel uh, in Western Australia a long time ago. People might remember him, but I managed to talk him into um, uh, bringing me to Sydney and introducing me to Graham Cowan. And, and um, at that point in time, they were getting ready to go race again with Johnny Cowan driving. Uh, so, I, you know, one thing led to another and I, I made my way to a, to a race at Willow Bank and, kind of learn the ropes from Darren Morgan, actually, doing the bottom end uh, on Cowan's car, which is kind of funny. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically Cowan gave me a job to, to move to Sydney. And myself and Tim Adams, we worked for, for Graham for uh, a couple of years uh, racing before he decided to come over here to the U.S. <clears throat> okay. So you went to the U.S. with the Cowan family, um, worked for them for the – one season they were over there racing, is that right? Yeah, it was actually more like 18 months. Um, we come over here in 2004 and we ran IHRA and NHRA, um, you know, with our business visas and stuff. Uh, we were kind of three months on, three months off. Uh, so we weren't, weren't here for the entirety of the, of the season uh, of 04 and then into 05. Um, but in 2005, when, when Graham elected to um, basically take everything back to Australia, uh, he gave me the option to to stay here in the U.S. and uh, and you know if I wanted to get a job and I did that and luckily enough Richard Hogan hired me to to go work with him at Don Schumacher Racing on Melanie Troxel's Dragster and it's kind of been um, you know a whirlwind ten years or so uh, since that point in time and uh, you know I found myself at Lucas and and here we are. Okay, so you. You've compacted a fair amount into a very short little sentence there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you, you went to DSR. You were working as a, a, a bottom-end guy slash clutch guy, I think, at the time. Um, only a year later, that, that entire team moved across to the Lucas camp, yeah? Yeah, in 2007, we started racing uh, a, a second operation, a second car here at Morgan Lucas Racing. So Melanie Troxel drove the car still that I worked on, and that was – it was that core group that I had worked with at Schumacher. We basically transplanted over here and, and put on a second car at Lucas. So, yeah, 2007 was my first year working um, at MLR, and uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of things happened uh, in the next few years, and I found myself uh, actually working on Morgan's car instead of the other car, and um, I basically became – a crew guy for Morgan uh, in 2008 until he decided to uh, – step out of the driver's seat in 2014. Okay, which opened the door for every boy's dream. Uh, you get to drive a fuel car at the big show. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty cool. All my Christmases had come at once, you know. Um, we had seen it before over here in the US particularly where, you know, people like Eric Medlin and Robert Height, they'd made that jump from crew member to driver, but you know, for me to get that golden ticket and that, you know, <laughs> lucky, lucky opportunity to um, to get my top fuel license, uh, not only in Morgan Lucas's car, but Brandon Bernstein's car. Um, uh, it was it was it was a pretty uh, neat experience. I'd say it was like, it, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. And uh, I kind of jumped in the deep end. But man, it was it was so cool. Now, careful what you wish for. I've, I've thrown the line at you that, you know, living every boy's dream. But you, you've worked incredibly hard to get there. I mean, as you said, it's a 10-year whirlwind that seems to you're an overnight sensation. All of a sudden, you're in the seat of a top fuel car at the big show. But you'd put in the hard yards to get there. You'd proven it. You'd, um, you'd done some licensing in alcohol to, to take that step, that transition. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I was, yeah, I had worked on the race cars for, for quite a long time and, um I was content doing that. Just super lucky to be over here and working on race cars and winning races in the NHRA. And I was, you know, I had my eyes set on maybe becoming a crew chief over here someday. So I wanted to, you know, work on every aspect of a top fuel car or funny car. And uh, 
just learn as much as I could. And um, yeah, I guess, you know, kind of hard work pays off. Uh, at least it did for me. And, and that's ultimately what led Morgan and, and, you know, Forrest and, and our sponsors at the time um, to, to take that leap of faith and let an unknown driver like myself uh, get into one of the quickest top fuel cars in the world and, and go live his dream. So unknown, we can't uh, can't let that go without passing, mate. You, so you went from a, an eight second FC Holden at Adelaide to a four second fuel car, one of the fastest cars on the planet. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was a long time between drinks too. I think you know racing at FC Holden in in Adelaide to uh, getting my top fuel license and and uh, you know running what was a couple of the quickest licensing passes in NHRA history. Yeah, you know the Lucas Oil Raceway here in Indianapolis was, you know, that was a, a big, uh, a big step, you know, it was, but it was a pretty cool day and I'm glad everything worked out. <laughs> well, it seems to have worked out fairly well. So your first season being 2015, if I'm correct, um, it didn't take you too long to, to hit the winner's circle. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually started driving full time in 2014 and I won English town pretty early in the season in uh, early June. So um, I think that was my ninth event start. And uh, yeah, you know, to, to win, you know, at a at a track like English town, which, you know, I grew up reading about was was pretty neat beating Doug Coletta in the final round. Um Earlier in the day, in the second round of eliminations, I staged the race car with a flat front tire and still ran 377 and beat Dom Lagana. So I got some pretty cool memories about winning uh, English Town, but you know, to to follow that up with winning uh, the U.S. Nationals in Indy in 2014 was, uh, yeah, more than I could have ever wished for. So a lot happened in a very short period of time. We also had uh, our daughter Emma. So man, there's there so many things going on in my life. It was all a blur. Well, you stole my next question, mate. I was going to say you you weren't content with you know winning your first Wally after six or seven races. You went on to to cap that by winning the U.S. Nationals in your very first year. I mean, the most prestigious drag race in the entire world. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's still to this day. Uh, you know, I can't believe that um, I was able to win Indy. You know, that's you know. It's the Bathurst. It's the Daytona 500. It's the uh, you know it's the Super Bowl of drag racing. And um, I, I'm pretty sure that a, a lot of people were scratching their head, their head when uh, some kind of new newer uh, newcomer Australian kid up and up and wins Indy. So I mean, you know, that's truly living the dream. And it just goes to show how lucky I was to drive great equipment so early in my career and uh, having a great team behind me and a great crew chief like Aaron Brooks obviously is what got me over the line but um yeah it's it's uh it's it's been everything I hoped it would be and more now you mentioned uh I, I couldn't agree with you more that's a, that's an amazing tale I mean you'll be telling that to your grandkids now you, you you've again <laughs> stolen the next line and you know how, how could you top those two awesome feats but your beautiful wife Stephanie delivers you your gorgeous First child, Emma. I mean, that was uh, that's that's got to be right up there, if not surpassing uh, an Indy win. Yeah, of course. You know, um, everyone told me how special it would be to have your own kid, and you know, once that day comes, you really realise what they mean, and uh, that's that's your legacy. You know, so I've just uh, Stephanie, Steph, and I were so lucky, and we're having a good time with Emma. She's she'll be three in May. Um, not long after I get home from uh, from from a trip to Sydney, and um, yeah, we're just cherish, cherishing every moment, having a great time. So I'm not sure if I'll be too keen to to let her go racing yet. I'm still I, I think I'm going to be too overprotective. So we'll see how that works out. Yeah, I I can see her in a Lucas Oil's junior dragster at eight 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 years and one day. Oh, it's younger over there, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think five years old now. It's crazy. <laughs> All right, well, she turns three, so you've only got two years to get over that phobia, mate. I'm, I'm sure you'll be right. Now, yep. um, I, I'm going to jump back to talking to you about the awesome life you've led over the last few years, but I see you having a wander around in the shop, and we'll get to that in a sec, but um, I'm jumping all around here because, I, as I said to you this morning when we previewed this, I could talk to you all day about what you guys have achieved. You've, you've brought up your trip to Sydney. Now, the, the Lamartina family, the El... LTFR Racing, 
Um, <laughs> I've made it possible for you to race for your first time back in Australia, your first time in top fuel in Australia, your first time driving a fuel car over 1,320 feet, and it couldn't be with a more professional, well-organised, well-oiled machine as, as the Lamartina Family Racing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, once again, um, I, I've always wanted to return home and, and race in Australia um, in top fuel if I ever could, if, if the situation arose. And, man, to do it with, you know, Phil and Sarah and, and Ange and, and the, you know, the entire Lamartina family and their crew, I mean, once again, here I am, first shot at doing something, which for me is traveling back to Australia to race, and I get to do it with, you know, top-level equipment with really professional team. It's... um. It's going to be really cool, and you know, obviously, I'm super grateful that they've given me this opportunity to, to you know, to check another awesome thing off of the list, and and that is to compete again on, uh, you know, on Australian soil and and in a top fuel car. So I'm really looking forward to it. You know, um, I I have been paying attention, uh, even though I've been disconnected from Australia, living over here and doing this stuff for for so long. It's uh, it the competition in Australia is still, you know. It's, it's nothing to sneeze at. So it's, it's going to be a, a heck of a race. And uh, I know that the Lamartina family and, and, the, and the crew that they have are going to give me everything we need to try and go win. Um, so hopefully we can do that. I mean, that would be the ultimate fairy tale. But I know we're going to have a, you know, a big task ahead of us trying to, trying to pull all that off in one, one go. Yeah, mate. I'll come back to that. But I can't, can't help myself but have a say, yeah. Of course you've been disconnected from Australia. You're a Carlton supporter. I mean, you, you wouldn't want to have seen what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about the footy, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I've, turned into a, I've turned into a, what we would call a fair weather supporter. Um, I hear about it when they're doing good and I, and I take my jabs, but I, I tend to ignore a lot of text messages and calls when they're getting getting their butt kicked all over the countryside. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, all right, I'll let you off it's there. Always um, fun to, it's always fun to have the back and forth, yep. Um, Jennifer Harrison from Andrews just popped on and said hi. I think she's caught up with you a little over there when she was there. So uh, she's watching and says to give you a shout-out. So, there, mate, you're – Coming back to Australia is going to be a huge shot in the arm for Top Fuel. Uh, all credit to yourself and to the, the Lamartinas. I mean, we could list the, we talked about the laundry list of what you've achieved in, in your short time over there. The laundry list is extensive of what the Lamartina family have done for Top Fuel racing in this country. And just another tick in the box, bringing Australia's own back to race at uh, Sydney May 5. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm hoping it's uh, you know, drag racing's on the on the upswing for sure. I mean, there's so much good racing in Australia and so many good racers, and and you know it it deserves to be you know Australia's premier motorsport, of course, in my opinion. But uh, you know, look, it, it's just going to be a great weekend, and um, you know, it seems like it's just around the corner. But I think this next couple months is going to be uh, you know, I'm going to be pacing around. I, I just can't wait to get over and race and. Uh, you know, mix it up with uh, with the competitors, but but also to catch up with a lot of the fans and and, and everyone, of course, that have supported me. And um, you know, I've got all the well wishes and the pats on the back. And whether I deserve them or not, you know, I'm just super grateful for the the amount of Australian fans that that have got behind me while I've been over here. So um, it's it's just going to be a great weekend, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sure you are, and we not as much as we are, mate, but. Um... Kane, yes, uh, this will be the first time that Richie's going to run over a quarter mile on a fuel car when he comes back to Australia, so for sure. Now, Richie, you said uh, you'll be pacing around and itchy feet. Uh, since you've been not in the driver's seat, uh, you've still had plenty to do, mate. You've uh, got a, a few th exciting things behind you that you might want to show the guys and have a little look around at what you've been doing this year and what's going to keep you busy between now and May. Yeah, I mean, of course, so this is the, the race shop end of things where we used to race, you know, race out of my car and Morgan's car. But um, what's near and dear to me is what I do week to week, day to day. And I always have, even since I've been driving, which is building race cars and parts. And uh, there's a little look in our engine room that's got some stuff going on and the blower room. But uh, this is the business end of the shop where the real work happens. And um, <laughs> um, 
right now we've got some hot rod work going on and pro stock bike chassis for Arana. And if you look real closely, that's Pete Exiberus over there. I'll let it, him explain to everyone what he's doing uh, over here in Indianapolis. <laughs> but uh, this, is, uh, this is where I work. This is something cool that I'm working on over here. It's uh, my 57 Chevy wagon for Drag Week. Uh, Hot Rod Magazine drag week. That's going to be really cool. Um, you just can't so get yeah, away from those plenty. personal wagons, mate. Well, yeah, it's, it, people think I've got something for wagons, but the nature of drag week is you've got to carry your own stuff from track to track. So I figured what better way to do it than with the wagon. But, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so this is where it all happens. Okay. So – your full-time job now is still at, at Morgan Lucas Racing. You're still a, a fabricator and, and chassis builder, etc. Uh, you guys are transitioning, I guess, the shop to more of a, a manufacturing plant than a racing plant. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's it. Yep. So it's now Lucas Racing and Fabrication. And, um, yeah, that's that's what we do. I've done some work for Brian Herder Motorsport on their rally car program and, you know, uh, a lot of different drag racing kind of stuff but uh we're really into every kind of uh, general fabrication there's a lot of projects within the lucas company that we can do as well so um yeah there's more than enough to keep us busy here <laughs> all right now i'd be remiss if you uh, for those few seasons you've won in the world you've got seven wallies out of eight finals I think you were saying you only ran 70 rounds over your career so far. Um, a 10% win rate would be very, the envy of anybody. You're not a, not a uh, what's the right word? You are a very enviable and marketable commodity. What are the chances of us seeing you in, in the seat of a, a race car again sometime soon in that uh, country? <clears throat> I, I'm not sure, you know. I'm kind of um, waiting to see how, how things pan out over here. You know, it's tough. you got myself, Larry Dixon, Sean Langdon. Um, everyone's looking to race again, but uh, everything has to work right. And we all know that these race cars run on money and sponsorship dollars. So um, I'm kind of taking my breath right now, uh, now that I'm not driving full-time in the NHRA um, and biding my time. But I like to think that before too long, I'll be back out here within the NHRA competing. But if I don't, um, so be it. You know, I'll relish these opportunities to come and race with Lamentina. And, and you know, um, I've been very fortunate in a very small period of time. So, um, you know, we'll just see what happens, I guess. Okay. Now, I know you said earlier, you know, you're not currently hotly pursuing a ride, but you've just brought up some some amazing names of guys who are currently pursuing a ride in a, in a, a serious manner. Uh, we've just seen Leah Pritchett, who has worked tirelessly hard into a ride, being able to fund a full thing. How hard is it over there really to get that gig, to get the ride, to get the sponsorship and the backing to be able to put on a 20-odd race series? Well, it's tough, you know, it, it's extremely expensive and, and it's got to be the right situation for everybody. So, you know, my early days for me driving, it was handed to me. So I'm now learning more about that side of the sport and the, the marketing aspect of it and what it takes to be a viable place for corporate America or Australia to put their money. So, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of hard to explain Leah has worked extremely hard and she's a great racer. And so she's a great commodity and, uh, um, you know, she's, she's worked hard to, to, you know, to get her, her position where she's at and she's making the best of it. So, you know, to use her for an example, you just got to push and, and, um, keep working hard and you never know what can come up. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's hard to get all of those things aligned as Larry Dixon and, and everyone will tell you. It's just, uh, it just has to be the right deal for everyone. And um, I'm going to keep working and see what happens, I guess. But uh, before okay. I, uh, I'm hoping I don't lose you guys. I got 1% battery left here on my phone. Right. So if I do, I apologize. And I want to say thank you, of course, and how excited I am to get over there in May. But uh, I guess let's keep going until this battery dies, <laughs> huh? 
<laughs> All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll try and wrap up. I think we have covered everything that we wanted to. Mate, we're just so extremely grateful for your time. As I said, I apologise for taking two years to get to you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make sure the next one's a lot shorter because I'm going to come and bug you in May when you're here and we'll get to do some coverage of you here racing in Australia for the Lamartina family. That would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. No, I really appreciate it, Brett. Can't wait to get over there, like I've said. And um, thanks uh, thanks to everyone involved that's just given me this great opportunity once again. It's uh, I'm, I'm truly the luckiest guy around. So it, it's going to be a good weekend in May. Awesome. All right, well, we'll let you go before you do run out of battery. Go and spend some time with your lovely family. And, um, again, mate, thanks so much for your time. I know that it's getting late over there in India, and we'll see you in May. Thanks so much. All right, Brett. See you. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Well, guys, there you go. Um, young Adelaide man living the dream. The hard work got the dream to happen. And, uh, again, thanks to the Lamartina family for bringing him out here. We're going to get to see him race at Sydney in May. We couldn't be happier for Richie. And let's hope that uh, we're not allowed to have favourites, but we'll certainly be cheering pretty hard for Richie and May. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Stay safe. Go fast. And we'll see you on Monday. Ciao.